Temple University. This is Profiles in Literature, featuring interviews with authors and illustrators prominent in American literature for children. The moderator for this series is Dr. Jacqueline N. Schachter, Professor of Children's Literature with Temple University. Welcome to Profiles in Literature. From New York City comes our guest, Richard Lewis, well known for his collections of children's poetry and prose from around the world. Helping to guide discussion with him are Mrs. Marjorie Farmer, Director of English Instruction for the Philadelphia School District, and Mrs. Carolyn Field, co-sponsor of our series of videotapes and Director of the Office on Work with Children of the Free Library of Philadelphia. It's a pleasure to feature Mr. Lewis. His collection of poetry of the English-speaking world, Miracles, written in, after a trip in cooperation with UNESCO, was awarded a 1966 American Library Association Notable Children's Book Award. Shortly thereafter, he issued Journeys, a collection of prose by children aged 4 through 14, and selected from 4,500 entries from the English-speaking world, countries uh, that speak English in Asia, Africa, the British Commonwealth, and the United States. He's moderated a New York radio show that deals with personalities of interest in the children's book world. He also has done record albums based on his collections of poetry. He, you have so many credits <laughs> that I want to list. Oh yes, uh, he has narrated the Weston Woods film In a Spring Garden that's based on his book, and started Touchstone Center, which contains Touchstone Players. This is children's theater. That's quite a, a list of accomplishments. Uh, do tell us, what is the main purpose of your anthologies? Well, <coughs> I suppose the main purpose uh, is, is uh, basically to act as a reflection of some of my own deeper interests about particular things uh, in terms of children's own writing. Um, it just isn't a, an interest in the writing of children, but in the, in the degree to which human beings possess a certain creative power. Um, in my work with um, Japanese and Chinese poetry. Um, it's also my particular interest in the area of, of what I think we can gain as a civilization from cultures other than our own. Um, in my work with Eskimo and various other indigenous groups around the world, um, again, it's my interest in, in, the, in the initial force of, of creative power that exists in all peoples and, and the means by which people express what is important to them. But regardless of the various cultures of the contributors, uh, much of your writing has universal appeal. Some students read their favorite poems and prose from your collections to a group of pupils in a public school and you'll see soon some of the art representations. I'd like to know what you think of these drawings, Mr. Lewis. Can you see them? Is that, that seems one, to be a tree, a tree, a representation of a tree done in the book <coughs> Miracles. Yes. Well, while we're looking at them, I, I must say something about um, what I feel about all children's art, is that it's a it's, it's, it's one of the most initial forms of visualization that we go through. And um, I see it as, as a means of reading the world. Uh, I'm very interested in reading. 
and um, not so much reading that deals just with words, but reading as we perceive the world. And I think that one of the things that the child is most attuned to is his visual reading, the, the, the degree to which he is able to, to take what he sees and, in effect, translate that into a visual image. Um, children are imagists, and that has a lot to do with the imagining power of the child. And all of these pictures, I think, certainly show us, again, another example of, of, of how the child is so deeply embedded in, in, in his sense of wanting to express what not only he sees outside of himself, but what he sees within himself. I wonder if you would share some of your favorites from your collections. OK, well, I'll, I'll just preface the favorites, if you don't mind. Um, it's very difficult to talk about favorites. I don't really have favorites. Just uh, some selections. OK, because each, each, each time I look at these books of mine, there are certain poems that strike me more deeply than others, because I'm changing, too. Um, well, I'd like to read the, the title poem of this, of There Are Two Lives, because I, I think that it has a, a power to it that, that has something to do with a few things that I've said just now. It's called Life, <coughs> and it's by a 10-year-old child from Japan. There are two lives. One is the nose, the second is the mouth. The nose and the mouth breathe. In the nose, there is the first lock, which can stop the breath. In the mouth, there is the second lock. If the keys are stolen, man will die. That's why we hide the keys. Uh, I, I, think, I think one of the extraordinary things about the child, if I may make a, a little preparatory note about that poem, is the degree to which the child is, again, dealing with essential questions. Um, and those essential questions have to do with questions that, as adults, we are constantly either suppressing or asking ourselves, and in a sense, being adults, we often feel we have to have an answer, whereas the child uh, is much more comfortable sometimes with the secret and the sense of mystery that is surrounding him. Um, he doesn't always need, quote, the, the answer. Just the ability to raise the question, I think, for the child is of uppermost importance to him. Um, when I spoke of learning from other cultures, I believe strongly that we can learn from the culture of the child in this respect, that um, by by, in fact, listening to his questions more deeply and, in fact, encouraging him to ask questions which don't necessarily have to have answers. Uh, I think we're getting much more into the realm in which the child is, is in fact, pursuing on his own. Um, we're dealing with the child, not the adult in the child, and there's a difference. Um, let me read this one at the end of the book, since we're talking about beginnings and endings. It's called Tunnel. This is by an 11-year-old. Now I stand in a tunnel. My teacher is walking far away. My friends are walking, dragging their feet in a wet tunnel. Just leisurely, I go to work. I eat. I watch TV. And in the tunnel, die. Uh, we were in Japan this summer, and I think one of the extraordinary things about Japan is the degree to which the culture of the Japanese is still concerned about innocence and the tension that exists in that country, which is exactly the tension here, I think, um, between the battle between innocence and, and progress. And um, I think that this poem, in its way, is a, is, is a fascinating expression of a child who is using perhaps the tunnel as a metaphor, the metaphor mm -hmm. in which, um, well, we're all in a tunnel, aren't we? <laughs> and I, I think that tunnel is getting closer and closer all the time with us. And I think one of the things that, that a child, again, is so extraordinary at is, is, is the degree to which he has a perception of seeing the real reality of something, not, not the false reality. And I think one of the things that we have to keep battling in so many ways is it, to some degree, the falseness of the reality that's constantly being perpetuated around us. Uh, the child is honest, and to keep that honesty, we have to also keep a certain element of innocence alive. 
Uh, that's why his approach to language, as I see it, is so extraordinary, because he sees the honesty of language before anything else. Language is something um, very real and very powerful. My little son, when he is just two now, and he's just learning to speak, and the, the extraordinary thing about his learning to speak is that he uses the language as a weapon. <laughs> it's a weapon into, it's like a weapon into the unknown. And he's constantly stabbing with words um, what is out there. And when, when he catches a, a meaning, he brings it back to us. And th th his language then seems to me to have a, an energy and an emphasis that, um, that gets quickly driven out of people because we don't see language anymore after a while as something which probes the unknown. We see it as a utilitarian element so much of the time. So that's why I, I, I'm particularly interested in children's dealings with language. May we have time to read some more? Oh, yes. Sure, OK. You may even want to probe some of your other books. Or right, I'll probe journeys. <laughs> <laughs> um, why don't we begin at the back? There's a poem in the back that has to do with beginnings. Um, one of the things I'm very interested in is process. And I, I think that the peculiar thing about process is that, that we have been made to think that there is always a beginning and an end. But for the child, uh, that, that um, progression of event is not as important to him. He's much more interested in the act of, of um, process itself. Playing is, is not something that has a beginning or an end. It's, it's, it's the act of playing. This poem by John, who's eight years old, I think expresses some of that. It's called At the Edge. When you come to the edge, you think you have come to the end. But you've only come to part of the beginning. The beginning is the start for anyone. You'll never come to the end, but keep on going. Now, I, I, I've always, this talk about favorites, well, I guess I can call that one of my favorites in a sense, because it's, to me, it's become something of a, well, I've inter internalized that, mm -hmm. that, that thought for myself. Uh, when mm -hmm. I first saw that, I, it, it, it struck a very deep note in myself because it seems to me that, again, this child, with his innate wisdom, was able to see that, that we're dealing with a process in, in the sense of life. Language is part of that process. Um, there is no such thing as the end of a sentence, by the way. I know that's provoking, <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> There really isn't an end of a sentence. Periods are fascinating things because they denote a sort of formal end of a, of a thought. But there is no such thing as the end of a thought. Thoughts have a way of transmitting themselves. And once they're transmitted, they continue on a course which sometimes we have no control over. Um, that's why when I say I'm interested in beginnings, I'm interested in the process by which people communicate. And in the communication, pick up elements which in turn become parts of other elements. Uh, what I'm really saying in a very ecological way, is the interconnection of all things. That language is interconnected with us and we're interconnected with language. It's not a separate entity from us. So when the child speaks about beginnings and going back to endings and going back to beginnings, he's talking about the interrelation that everything has. The child is really, again, the first ecologist that we have in that sense. Um, let me go back to the quote, unquote, the beginning of this book, Journeys. <laughs> There's a section called Beginnings. Um, oh, before I get to that, there's a little thing about, well, a child wrote this. He said, when I, what I want to write about, period, everything, <laughs> period. Um, <clears throat> now, I, I, well, the reason I, I put that in is that um, there, there is no such thing as choosing a theme for a child in terms of what he should write about. Because, in fact, the child is the deepest resource for himself. Um, he is everything. There is no two ways around that. He is everything. And everything that he is, he, he obviously is in touch with. And our, our, our position uh, in that, in terms of it being an adult with a child, is somehow to make him aware that we are getting in touch with the everything that's in ourselves. If he sees that through, again, another process of perhaps even call it imitation or what, he'll be sympathetic with us. Um, I think in teaching, there's, there's, a, there's a process of sympathy that has to happen before anything begins to happen with other people. And um, when this child says he wants to write about everything, it's really 
not the whole world, but it's about him. Of course. It's about him or her. Don't mean to be a male show. You go <laughs> Okay. Um, oh, I, I, a great one for picking things at random. This is by Rick, who was a boy who I worked alongside. I, see, I changed my, my footing a little bit there. I was going to say I worked with. Uh -huh. But, I, uh, but I, the more I think of dealing with people, I see that we have to think of it as working alongside of. Because Rick is probing some of the things that I'm probing, and we're sort of doing it together. He was nine when we probed together. It just goes, drops of dew, a thousand silver pennies, floating, slithering down layers of the sky and sun. Then, <clears throat> as it hits the earth, dies in silence. <clears throat> he um, has another thing in here, if I can quickly find it, that um, has to do with, um, with silence in a way. I don't know if I can quickly find it. I can't quickly find it, and since we're on television, there's always a, there's always a problem. No, I can't find it. Well, anyway, um, Rick, in terms of what we were probing together was silence. And um, uh, I think, in a way, that every child probes silence. Because silence is the equivalent of what I would call the unknown. And it's, it's the, at the grass root of the desire to, to speak. Um, there's always, <clears throat> even a cry, a child's cry, it seems to me, is, is a degree of breaking an element of the silence. But what we always have to go back to in order to realize the power of language is go back to silence itself. It's, it's, it's a fundamental part of the process. And I think Rick, even at the age of nine, was very aware of the, of the weight of silence and how to use that weight. Um, <coughs> let me see. Oh, this is a nice one. Uh, there's an exhibition in New York now of Chinese art, and it's called, I think, Old Trees Bear Stones. And the, uh, the idea of the exhibition is that for the Chinese artist, um, the tree was always a metaphor of life itself, and that this was constantly in their work. So John, at age 10, born in 19, what, 50 probably, something, not in touch with the Chinese, but still in touch with what you spoke of as universals, said, my tree is a mass of greenness and tallness and fatness. My tree has jagged leaves and is like an octopus soaking its leaves in the light. Hmm. Now, I think the beautiful thing about language is its ability to be transparent. And in a piece like this, the transparency is that it's not just about a tree. It's obviously about John. But it's not just about John. It's obviously about me and yourself and everybody out here. It's obviously about the tree that we are. And when he talks about a mass of greenness and tallness and fatness, I mean, that's, that's, that's not just weight anymore. That's, that's dealing with the whole sense of life being born, growth, and so on. And then he talks about the octopus soaking its leaves in the light. I mean, aren't we always doing that? I mean, our whole way of perceiving is, in fact, a form of soaking in the world, constantly perceiving and constantly soaking in. Um, we're really connected to the octopus in some ways. We really are. Um, <clears throat> oh, this is a lovely one. This is by Sally, who's only seven. Seven is a marvelous age, because um, uh, it's, it's that, that point at which I think um, language still hasn't, hopefully, that it hasn't become institutionalized yet. <laughs> it's still fresh. And this is Sally. Class one had Monday off and Tuesday off, and all the other classes had Monday and Tuesday off. And we played hide and seek, and my big sister hid her eyes and counted up to 10. And me and my brother had to hide. And I went behind the dustbin, and I was thinking about the summer and the buttercups and daisies and all those things and fresh grass and violets and roses and lavender in the twinkling sea and the star in the night and the black sky, and the moon. 
Now, the pivotal word in that whole thing is the word and. Mm -hmm. And playing is, is, really, is really a personification, the word you used a little while ago, is really a, a, person, a personification of the word and. Because that's what playing is. Playing is an extending always of and, of always going further and further and further and further. And I used it myself. Uh, and, and, and what I feel so strongly about lately is what we do to stop that and in so many children. We, 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 put, um, we put something around that and, and I don't know what it is, and I think it's something to do with our attitude towards playing. We say playing is not work, so we make work work and we make play play. We say playing is not, is not progress, is not growth, so we say it has something to do with mind, that, that growth has something to do with mind. And so what we do is we again divide the world into different parts. And one of the things that we divide the world in is, is the time for us to play and the time for us to do something else. Well, I'm not so sure like that octopus soaking its leaves that we're not in fact constantly in a process of playing. That again, perception, our way of dealing with the world as we soak it in is not in fact playing because we're always dealing with the and again. It's always going on and on and on. Even though we're not conscious of the changes, there are changes. And I think this is where the child, again, has that innate wisdom, is that nobody tells him how to play, that no child has ever been told, from the very beginning at least, that this is what play is. He, he in, in the miracle, no, he doesn't even learn it. <laughs> he does it because he has to. He has to. It's like it's, a, it's one of the great pr processes of, uh, of survival. And, and, and the child, just as he, s he cries in order to survive, he plays in order to survive as well. And that's why Sally's little piece is so marvelous, because she says something beautiful, which sort of goes, it touches a little bit of the subversive self that I have. She said, class one had Monday off and Tuesday off, and all the other classes had Monday and Tuesday off and we played hide and seek. Now, I have this great alternative plan someday, which I'll never get into, into any sort of a function, which is that we call school off altogether <laughs> and see what happens to people, is that maybe they'll learn once again the process of playing because they'll have to deal with that mar marvelous emptiness of, of time. <laughs> and And... That's what the child is dealing with. He's always dealing with open spaces, the open spaces of time, the open spaces of silence, the open spaces of space. And he's making out of all those open spaces resources. And that resource, the most obvious resource that he uses, is his innate ability to play. Language is part of that playing. And the minute the child is told that it isn't playing, forget it. It has nothing to do with him. It's, again, something which has to be learned outside of him. But I have never in my life encountered a child who has ever discovered language without the capacity of playing. But the minute the child uses its mouth and discovers its mouth, of course, which he discovers very early in life, he's in fact learning to deal with the sound out there and the sound in here and jumbling it all around until what you finally get is a sound that has a meaning. And he can't do it unless he plays. So he's always playing in that sense. Now, before yes. you read another selection, because Sorry. I think these are so rich, let us first hear from um, Marjorie Farmer and, you know, get some repartee. Play, of course, is part of the whole miracle of, of language and, and living that's so important, uh, an element in the, I hate to say elementary school program because I immediately begin to sound and feel like the kind of institutional school person that I think you're talking about. And when you suggested that maybe we, we ought to close all the schools and then see what would happen. What would happen if we helped all the teachers who work with all the children in all the schools have this sense of, of the miracles that you have collected here for us and give them an opportunity to understand what it is the children are saying to them. See, the children are coming with a, a freshness of language and a freshness of perception, 
And perhaps in this instance, the child really is father to the man. Mm. And you know how hard it is for mm. us to understand our fathers. Yes. <laughs> the ghost of them always lingers. Yes. Yes. How do you do this? How do you help the, uh, the teachers, perhaps, that you work with, teachers in training mm. or teachers who are working with, with children, well, to share the miracle? That's a very good question, because mm. most of our students are teachers in mm. training some perhaps in service, mm. and you're so interested in teacher training, too. Mm. Well, let me define a little bit what I feel about that. Uh, I think I'm a teacher in training myself. Um, uh, in fact, I'm not a teacher. I'm a person in training. In fact, I'm not in training. I'm just a person. Uh, and what I mean by that is that I think the first thing we have to do before we reach any level of understanding with a child is, a, is obviously a point of understanding about ourselves and to sense those things that are obviously a part of us that are in a sense a part of, of every child. Uh, I don't believe that the child dies in us. I don't believe in fact, I, initially to be honest with you, come to think of it, I don't really believe so in the so-called childhood moving on to adolescence to, and then to adulthood. I really don't believe in those distinctions because I think those are sort of arbitrary distinctions that, that have been made up for our convenience, but it has nothing to do with nature. Uh, and we're nature, you see. And uh, we don't say, you know, that the tree, a, tr a tree is a child or a tree is an adolescent um, or it's an adult. We don't talk in those terms. But uh, we have about human beings, which is sort of interesting, um, because it's again where the brain has uh, out, out, outdone itself. <laughs> in terms of, of the natural process. So I think before we even talk about training, we have to talk about talking, which is another way of saying we have to talk about what we are doing through communicating with ourselves and communicating outside of ourselves. We have to get down to the nitty gritty, so to speak, of the, if you want to use it as such, the, the, the very miracle an extraordinary thing called languaging, which, as I mentioned a moment ago, just doesn't take place with words. It takes place with gesture. It takes place with the visual presentation of something. It takes place in a numer innumerable ways. But we have to get down to that. Once we begin to deal with that, then I think we can deal with a training situation, which has nothing to do with us. It happens to do with putting ourselves in training with forces that we have to understand outside of ourselves. It's, again, an ecology that we have to train, become the trainees of nature itself. We have to see what we are doing and what we can learn from the natural element. Through perhaps becoming open to it in the sense that We've been talking about it here. Yes, yes. Open to it, open to it, and and humble, yes. in the sense that we are recognizing that we are an integral part of nature itself. Once we recognize that, I think we're on the road to being trained by the process of growth that is taking place within us, and we can't do that until we come down about thirty steps. <laughs> Because at this point, as I see it, most of mankind is, is way up on a ladder, which is sort of very shaky. And he refuses to get off the ladder until he's going to be thrown off by the weight of gravity. Then, when he's on the ground crying, he will realize that gravity has something to do with, 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 with the process of nature itself. Thank you very much, Richard Lewis. Uh, you are known not only as an anthologist, but also as a lecturer on children's literature and creative writing. It's been a pleasure hearing from you.